Thank you. Thank you. I don't know, I kind of feel like some of you should go out there and tell everybody that I'm talking. Because I'm a very important person. Okay, well, that's fine. So, um, you got an introduction to me and supposedly why I know what the hell I'm talking about. By the way, I swear a lot, I hope you don't mind. Um, I do a pretty uncensored stuff. If you've, how many of you have listened to Sovereign Tech, my show? Woo! Woo, right on, yeah, there it is. There's a much smarter man than me back there, but uh, anyway, yeah, uh, so if you've ever listened to my show, I'm a pretty uncensored guy, uh, and a lot of what I'm about to talk about is stuff that I've been covering really for years on that show. Um, but it changes while I've been talking about it for years. The reason that I can talk about it for years is because this information changes really by the day in our interconnected, internet-run world. I mean, this stuff just changes all the time. Uh, it's good for me as a podcaster because that means every week I have something new to talk about, uh, like every single week, and it'll probably be that way for years, uh, for the rest of my life, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, but also, it's good to get it all together at once or if people haven't been introduced to it because honestly, I don't expect anybody to listen to me two hours every week for the rest of their lives. I can barely listen to myself for that long. So, yeah. Um, all right, I guess I'll start off with a little audience participation. Thank you all, of course, for being here who are here. Uh, how many of you love Amazon? I mean, like a big wet heart, like you love Amazon. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, loving is different than using. I think we all, okay, all right, all right, all right. So how about, how many people here love Facebook? I mean, you're just like, your nipples get hard when you log on to Facebook. You know what I'm saying? No? Okay, well, that's good. How about Google? Anybody's just like, man, Google can take all my data. They can go right for it because what the services they gave me, they're just phenomenal. I mean, what do you think? Any, anybody, any takers on Google? Got some, got some thumbs down? Got a little bit of a hand up. That's all right. That's all right. Don't, don't be afraid. I'll make fun of you later. It's not, at first we won't. Uh, no, I'm kidding. So how about Microsoft? This is kind of the wild card. Ooh. You kind of like Microsoft. Yeah, I understand. I actually kind of understand that. Um, all right, how about the last one? How about Apple? How many people like Apple? Man, there's a guy here who's just doing thumbs down the whole time. I'm just like, this is my new hero. This is fantastic. Now, anyway, that's all right. If you raise your hand, that's totally fine. I completely understand. I hope to completely change your mind, but I completely understand. Um, none of these companies, to make this clear, none of these companies, well, here, let me ask this quick. Do you think they care about you? Like, do you think that they actually like care? I mean, the, the, the degree to which they are a part of your life, how often do you pick up your phone, right? How, much, how often are you just pulling that thing out and flipping with it when you're waiting at the grocery store or something like that? The degree with which they've invaded your life, they know more about you with all of the data and metadata, which metadata is data about data that they collect about you. They collect all this stuff. Wouldn't you, I, I mean, they know more about you than your doctors do. And they also don't have the same, not that I care about laws, I'm an anarchist, but uh, they don't have anywhere near the regulations or legal hurdles that they have to go through to, you know, to have all that data or to even like protect it or something like that. As to where doctors, there's a lot of patient doctor confidentiality, things like this. But do you really think they care about you? The rate raise of hands. Or are you still like, yeah, but it's the market, so I can tell them to F off or something like that. I'm sorry, I should say fuck off. Okay, so that's the thing. I want you to think about that, that these are people who have more data about you than your doctor, than just about, than honestly, probably governments, even though you know, they have a revolving door with governments, certainly. Um, and they, I mean, they're just so in on you and they don't care about you. You know, there's stuff you wouldn't share with people you might even actually love, financial information. I mean, like people talk about, you know, uh, perhaps if they have certain addictions or, you know, they abuse certain things, whatever. I mean, you know, I'm not judging on any of that crowd, but there's people who talk about that way more than they'll talk about finances. But these people know everything about you. Why do you think Apple set up Apple Pay? Do you think it was just to make your life convenient? Are you kidding? No. Apple wants to have all this information about you so that they can use it. They can sell it. Or, hell, maybe Apple wants to become its own bank, which I think is something that's gonna happen. I mean, Mitsubishi did a little turnaround years ago. Mitsubishi, everybody know Mitsubishi? You know the company, right? 
Yeah, big electronics company, big car company and all that. They were originally a bank, and then they switched into electronics a few decades ago. So companies can do this little bait and switch here and there. And I mean, how would you feel if suddenly, I don't know, in a few years, Apple comes out and says, oh yeah, we're a bank now, and they're, say, working with the Federal Reserve or something along those lines. You've been giving them all of that data for so long. I mean, you, want, you think the IRS knows how to get your, well, they don't know how to get your tax information. They have tons of trouble with that. But you'd run into some pretty quick problems pretty fast, and I think you'd be scared. And wow, they're really loud back there, but that's okay. We got some competing microphones. Can you hear me okay? All right. So that's the first thing I want you to consider, is how much information you're giving them about you and whether or not you think they actually care about you. Nobody raised your hands when I asked, do you think that they care about you? Now, do they have to care about you? No, not really, they don't have to care about you. Um, I mean, they're just a business. You could say they're just doing business. Um, I would argue that they trample upon your human liberties, such as privacy, among others. Um, but yeah, no, I guess they don't really have to care about you. But then people that don't care about me, I also don't tell them my deepest, darkest secrets. I don't trust them with my life. I don't trust them with much of anything. Why would I trust them? So I'm making a philosophical appeal to you here to reconsider your relationship with particularly the tech giants. Because they, I mean, really, they just don't care. They want all of the data. I mean, and you know, it's actually kind of okay. If they just wanted to collect the data about you, where you are, when you're shopping, where you're shopping, all of these different things, that actually wouldn't be too terrible if perhaps they made your data anonymous, if they encrypted it before, that it, went, before it went to their servers, if they did something like encryption at client side, uh, that's what they call that, where it's not being done on some server somewhere, but where it's actually happening right on your device. That's a proper way to do encryption for all of this. It could be a little more palatable if these companies did that, but they don't. You know, and if anything, they're doing it at their servers, if they even do it there. But then again, something that a lot of people don't realize is that in the United States, if you run a business in the United States and you have servers that, report, you know, that are used for your business, which what business today doesn't, they are required by law to hand over any data on those servers. This was something discovered a long time ago by a guy who used to work for Microsoft, Casper Bowden, who the late, great Casper Bowden. Uh, he proved the point and, and showed you know, that, yeah. And I mean, these companies, to even function in this country, cannot protect your data. They could try and encrypt it and they could do that, but none of them do. So what's the big idea? What's the score? Well, you can't trust them, or at least I think the case is made that you can't trust them. They don't care about you either. They're not gonna go to toe for you. Does anybody have like an argument against that? Like that you think that the, the tech giants would actually take on the government if, if they were coming after your data? Is someone gonna bring up like San Bernardino or something? What do you got? You... Yeah, yeah, San Bernardino, right? Yeah, so here's the funny thing about that. Apple said, what Apple actually said to the FBI is that look, if you didn't fuck it up, if you didn't try to crack into this device too many times, we would have helped you. But they took it to the point of no return. But Apple would have helped them out. So, that, I mean, that's, that's kind of the ugly thing about this, is that, okay, you know, some of these tech giants can talk a pretty big game, and they can say, oh yeah, no, no, we're protecting this, we're protecting that. Or how about Microsoft? Another example people might bring up is Microsoft uh, protecting their Outlook server, their email server, in Ireland. And in Ireland, you know, they're saying, well, you know, this is in Ireland, you don't, you know, the, the US DOJ, you have no right to go look at those email servers, absolutely not. You're not touching this. Um, and they were fighting a pretty big game, kind of like Apple was with the FBI over the San Bernardino shooting. Well, then the Cloud Act passes a few months ago, right? That all goes through. And then Microsoft just says, okay, well, look, yeah, here's the law. Now we have to hand it over to you. Just protect us and don't, don't allow us to get into any trouble, uh, you know, legal trouble of any kind for handing it over to you. So once again, the users are kind of getting in position, ready to go. So these companies just don't care about you. I, I, I mean, and if, if anyone does have another example you want to bring up, I may not have heard about something. I'm totally open to that. I am a, a genuine genius, but I might have missed something. No, I'm not that smart. <laughs> Actually, my girlfriend is way smarter than me. You have no idea. It's awesome. Uh, but if you have another example, bring it up. I'm open to it. You can... They don't want to harm their reputation. Right. So even when they do protect your privacy, it's not a sense about you, it's more of a reputation still. 
Okay, sure. It's, it's yeah, it's about their reputation. Yeah, I, yeah. Now, you know, the funny thing is, like, Microsoft, the, and this annoyed the hell out of me. When the Apple FBI thing happened, Microsoft did such a better job of describing, they said, look, we'd never let you open one of our letters. Why would we let you open an email? Like, they, their language in their defense against the DOJ was perfect. Eons better, and they were even arguing from human liberties and everything, way better than what Apple was doing. Apple was just saying, well, our customers, blah, blah, blah. As to where Microsoft is even making a philosophical case. The tech, the tech industry, the tech journalists, all of them, nobody cared that Microsoft was talking that way. I was kind of rooting for them, because I thought Microsoft had changed recently. Uh, but in any case, with the Cloud Act happening, that, that sort of changed. Thank you for closing those doors, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so I don't think you can trust any of these tech giants. I think you have to take these matters into your own hands. You have to take care of your own protection of your data. You, I think it's a good idea for you to not just hand over your data at the drop of a hat. I don't think that your ability to get from A to B in some kind of efficient way through traffic is worth you telling Google every little goddamn thing. And I think that if it was any other, what, what if it wasn't Google? What if, if you thought of it, well, okay, the government made this really efficient process. Like what if the, well, I mean, the government did technically create GPA, right? That's an army thing and they opened it up in the 80s, blah, blah, blah. Yay, Reagan, I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm kidding about the yay, Reagan part. Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're kind of behind that, but like what if, you know, what if the NSA literally came out and said, here's this awesome map app. We just need your data. I mean, who, who would sign up for that? It's okay, I, I won't shame you too hard. You, you, can, you can raise your hand. I mean, like, let's say it was the most amazing thing. It got you, you're going through New York City. I'm a, I'm a New York boy. Uh, you're going through New York City, and I don't know, you just got through Manhattan. I mean, you got through so many blocks inside of like somehow five minutes. I mean, it's just this incredible thing. Would you trade that? Is it worth it to hand it to the NSA? What data do they want? What data do they want? Everything, whatever. The, so, okay, that's a great, I love that question, actually. What data do they want? Everybody got one of these? Oh, you all failed. <laughs> I failed too, I have one. Um, the average smartphone today in 2018 has almost 30 sensors inside of it, and that's what they want. 30 sensors, how much data do you think 30 sensors can collect? They're collecting stuff you can't even imagine. Um, and powering it off, that doesn't help either because a few, years, a few years ago in Android devices, and I'm pretty sure Apple does the same thing, they put in a, what's called a voice coprocessor. And this allows for, you know, isn't this, I hope I don't, actually I do hope I set off some of your stuff so you realize how creepy it is. If you say, hey Google, wherever the device is, sometimes even when it's like on to sleep or powered down, it can get activated and it can turn on with that. Also though, that means that that is always running and there's an entire processor, there's an entire piece of hardware, it's not even software, an entire piece of hardware that is constantly listening. Alexa is nothing, it's hilarious. How many people here own an Alexa? Come on, be honest. Woo, okay, thank you for being honest. There's like three or four of you. You think Alexa's bad? Alexa has nothing, if you're, if people that argue against Alexa, I appreciate the honest people out there, I really, I'm, I'm dead serious. If you think Alexa's a problem and you're carrying one of these around, that's a joke. I just made fun of myself. I'm just gonna go over here and cry for a minute. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going over here to cry. I need my tablet. Actually, ironically, what I need is an Amazon device. Oh no. This is how we're trapped, folks. Like I said, there's a difference between love and use. So this is a Kindle Oasis. That's not important, that doesn't matter. Um, but there's something that I want to read to you from it, because if we're going to talk about how you actually get started on taking control of your data and taking, and really, a concept to understand is that as much as you rely upon Google Maps being so damned good at what it does, at getting you just where you need to go, did it work for getting you to Rogers Campground? By the way, I guess so. You're all here, right? Yeah. How many of you use Google Maps to get here? Be honest, be honest. I did too. Yeah, yeah, okay. What is it? Waze? Yeah, Waze owns, yeah, it might as well be Google Maps. Right, yeah, they own Waze. Um, yeah, well said. So, all right. So you use that to, you use that to get here. Um, I lost where I was gonna go with that, so don't mind me. Okay, if we're gonna take control of our data, this is the point that I wanna, I wanna get to here. Um, to start on that, to start on taking control of your data. The, I'm gonna show you not where we start, 
but where the end game is. And I'm going to quote, I'm going to read from, in my opinion, the best security researcher in the world. I know you're thinking I'm going to just read my own book, but I'm not. Okay. By the way, darkandroid.info, you can pre-order the Dark Android 2018 edition. Go for it. $2.99, can't beat it. Okay, so here, this, the guy that I'm actually going to read from is Steve Gibson. Steve Gibson is the guy that came up with the term spyware. How many people have heard of the term spyware? Everybody, of course. So you'd think the guy that came up with that was probably pretty good, yeah? Yeah, he's that good. Uh, personal hero of mine, he runs a podcast also called Security Now, far better than Sovereign Tech, but I had to try. You know, when you just love a man that much, you got to copy him. Um, so anyway, here, this is a guy, he's been around forever. Uh, he's behind all kinds of uh, different software that people maybe not even realize that they use. Uh, but Steve Gibson, all the credentials in the world, this is what he says about how to actually be private, secure, and anonymous. And if anybody was at my Dark Android, uh, my Dark Android workshop earlier, you're going to hear this again, but it bears repeating. So the only way, I mean, if you absolutely need anonymity, is to roll together old school approaches and new school. What does he mean by this? Go somewhere to do this as far away from home as convenient. Be anonymous there. Pay with cash. Don't go somewhere familiar. Don't know anyone. Don't make any friends. Don't talk to anyone. Don't stay long. Now, come on, libertarians. We're not going to have a hard time with that, are we? <laughs> I mean, really, not make friends? Come on. <laughs> Be honest. I know. I'm making fun of myself. Don't feel bad. OK. So we can get that part down. Um, don't talk to anyone. That's easy, too. Uh, don't stay long. Yeah. Plan ahead. Rehearse for speed. Get it done and leave. And again, this is whatever you're trying to do. Maybe you're trying to get some, we'll call it medicine. OK. Uh, these are the, this is the process, this is the end game. This is how you do it right from the best in the business. Don't do anything there that involves, again, you're going to some remote location. Don't do anything there that involves your own real world identity. Pay with cash, change the MAC address of your machine, maybe buy a cheap laptop, and just for this purpose so that it knows nothing, you have no history tied to it and so forth. So he's saying, get a completely separate device that knows nothing about you, you've never used it for anything else, there's no identifying information on it whatsoever, and go rock and roll with it. And anybody that was at my workshop got one of those. Okay, reading on. And I would say, since you have control over Tor, how many people here know about Tor? Good, I don't have to explain it, okay. Unless you really want me to, you can come up and ask a question about it. Use more than three nodes. Don't use the default settings. Use as many as you can so that you're, oh, and use widely geographically dispersed tours, tour nodes. The, those will be slower because all the traffic bouncing around has to go through all of those locations. Keyword there, things are gonna go slower. I'll get to that. So yes, it's not going to be as quick and easy, but to get to anonymity, it can't be. I'm gonna read that one more time. To get anonymity, it can't be easy. Do what you need to do and then pack up shop and leave. So new school and old school. And that's what he means by that. Old school means like the old physical tricks, going somewhere else to do your business. New school is use the latest encryption. Got a question, Tor? Nah, that, that, so there's a lot of arguments that go back and forth about whether Tor, I mean, the one that I think is ridiculous is when people say, well, they're funded by the Navy. There's, you know, if, if, you, if you painted, if you had a, if, let's say this was the globe, and I was up here like some, some mad scientist or dictator, and I was covering where all my money was, and I was like, you know, the, the tyrant of the entire planet, I was the government, my money would literally be everywhere. And for governments today, it's absolutely true. There's just government money everywhere. Like, like to claim that some piece of software is not trustable because they get government money is crazy. Everything gets government money. So, but, but that's not your point. Your point is there's like actual technical issues. There's a back and forth on that. Okay, well, yeah, well, we might get into that a bit. So the point I want to get to, though, with that quote is that it can't be quick and easy and things are going to run slower. And this is where people run into issues because you could do all the things that I could give you, all the recommendations I can tell you. I can tell you to install Signal, install this, blah, 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 start using Tor, etc. And suddenly you won't be able to watch YouTube and none of you will listen to me. It's like, oh, hell, I can't watch Netflix? 
I guess I'll just do this. Oh, Sense 8's pretty good. Okay. Anyway, sorry. I love Sense 8. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the deal, is this thing that I call the tenth law of thermodynamics, is I have to keep correcting because I actually had one person come up to me and say, there aren't ten laws of thermodynamics. And I was like, oh, no shit. But anyway, I call it the tenth law of thermodynamics. And it's, there's always a trade-off between security and convenience. There's always a trade-off between privacy and convenience, anonymity and convenience. There's always, always, always a trade-off. If you listen to a podcaster, and if they ever tell you, I don't care, libertarian, tech guy, whatever, it doesn't matter, and they tell you that no, we can make these things easier, we can get to the point where grandma can use it, they're lying to you and they don't know what they're talking about. They just don't, unless they are going to create a quantum leap in technology, which I have to be careful because I, never, I didn't exactly see Bitcoin coming. Not exactly. So that was clever. Okay, but there is, you, you're going to have to, to do this, to take control of your data, your privacy, your security with what you're doing in your life in today's interconnected mobile device fucking everywhere world. You're gonna have to learn some stuff. Now, they've made a lot of it very simple, thankfully, I mean, or fairly simple, but it's a little more than just, you know, installing stuff from the Google Play Store or the App Store, okay? There's a little work involved. There's a little thought that goes into it, and I'm not saying you can't handle it. I firmly believe you can handle it. Okay, I'm just saying, I think everybody can handle it. I'm just saying it's gonna to have to be done. And I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for questions when we get into this, okay? Because, you know, like I'd love to know, and I'm happy to answer, okay, I wanna get this kind of privacy, I wanna be able to do this. How do I solve this problem? I wanna answer those things for you. So if you have questions, get ready for them. Or if you have security questions or something like that, we'll talk about them. Uh, but to start talking about this, the easiest thing I could tell you to do is to stop relying and stop carrying this little box, this little infinity box around with you all the time, okay? The other thing I could tell you is that to use networks like Tor or to do other things, you know, there's a lot of, I, I heard it just in the previous talk, somebody brought up Zencash. Uh, I'm intrigued by that project. There are, I mean, that could potentially be like an entire alternative internet. How about mesh networking? How many people have heard the term mesh networking? Brilliant, yes. Okay, mesh networking is the idea of having a decentralized, well, there's a bunch of different terms for this, but basically it's a decentralized internet. The concept is, is that you don't need servers and it defeats censorship from governments and whatever else, okay? Uh, very laudable goal, great thing to go towards. To have that, you are going to run into speeds, generally, as in speeds of the transmission of data, Say you can even encrypt it through Tor, you could be running a VPN even on the, I mean, which you could on a mesh network, really. I mean, all these different things that you want to do to make sure that data is really secure, and the NSA is going to at least have a very hard time looking at it. You are not going to be able to watch YouTube. That's the bottom. Like, most of these things, most of these technologies that are getting developed right now, they're, they're Achilles heel, or where people freak out, is that video just, you can't watch videos over, this, over these uh, you know, networks because they're just too slow. But those networks at the same time are respecting you as an individual, which I hope that you understand Google does not respect you as an individual, nor do they give a damn about, your, about you, you know, let alone your data. I mean, they want your data, but you know, they don't want to respect it. Why can't you have both? Why can't you have both? That's, yeah, get a guy that does both, right? Well, there's only one of me, so sorry, but uh, no. Uh, so why can't you have both? Right now, I mean, you have, actually with video specifically, okay, and I really want to drive this point home because I think, I mean, have you heard, while you're at Porkfest, has, has anyone heard like of any technologies that you're just like, oh man, I can't wait to use that, you know, to get like some privacy and everything? Have there been other speakers talking about that stuff? You can raise your hand. You don't have to tell me the technology. Okay, well, you're gonna hear about them at certain points, right? Um, you know, you'll hear about these awesome technologies, but again, th th all of that is just gonna slow everything down. Like, I mean, for it to do it right, it slows things down to the point that it just makes video untenable. I mean, you can't, I mean, you could maybe like really low quality video, um, but, but just by the nature of these things, like the idea of them not being centralized. Uh, 
I mean, people don't realize just how big of a problem video is. Video is a huge problem. Um, they don't know just how much Netflix and YouTube and Venmo, or not Venmo, whatever. Is it Venmo? Whatever, the other one. Vimeo. Vimeo, thank you, not Venmo. I know what Venmo is, Vimeo. All these different things, like, you don't know how much they're cheating on the back end to get that video to you. It's, I mean, it's miraculous work that they're doing. Uh, no one is doing more, arguably more important work in tech than people that are figuring out how to compress video. It's that tough, it's that hard, it's screwing up everything, and it's the whole reason that people have become, in my opinion, and in a very real sense, why people have become reliant upon, uh, you know, central servers and like this big centralized internet. Because as soon as they try to do something else, you know, whoever, whatever platform comes in here and says, we put it all on blockchain. They didn't put video on blockchain, not really, not really. But, you know, there's a guy back there, actually, that worked with a company that began with an A. They, they never really licked video, right? No, it all went on, uh, on IPFS. It all, yeah, it all went on IPFS, something like that. Yeah, sure, which there's inherent issues there. That's a whole other story. So, exactly. So, there's companies out there that have been trying this stuff, and it's just a real problem. But I just, w and I bring that up, not to give you a, a class on video compression, because that's boring as shit. Okay, I bring it up because I want you to understand that to have actual security, privacy, anonymity, and all these things to try and defeat everything that alphabet soup organizations and governments are trying to collect about you, there are trade-offs, and there will always be trade-offs at this time. Okay, that's the point I'm trying to drive home to you. So n my point, not relying on this, Great thing, maybe leave it at home sometimes. I don't know, I know it's hard to imagine that. Now we can't even remember our grocery lists or telephone numbers for people or anything else when we go, I'm the same way. Uh, but I usually only shop for myself, so I guess I'm okay on that end. But anyway, um, we rely on it for so much, but so much of what it does is really empowering these domination structures, these tyrannical organizations that I think everybody's here complaining about, rightfully so. Damn right, I'll, I'm right there with you. So I want you to understand that. Um, but at the same time, I understand that people aren't going to give these devices up. So how do we do these devices right? What's the best way that we can mitigate the amount of data collection uh, that happens for us? Well, first off, you can buy my book, and I talk a lot about it there getting away from the tech giants. And there are alternatives to just about everything that, well, not Amazon shipping, not their store, but a lot of the other stuff that Amazon or the stuff that Google or Microsoft, Apple, whoever, take your pick of the company that they do, there are alternatives that actually respect you as a human being as to where, like I said, the other companies do not. So we can explore some of those alternatives that are out there. Um, but at the very beginning, philosophically, it's great to just have it in mind that, wait a minute, like thinking twice about what you're actually doing with your device, the picture you're taking and all that. So how many parents do we have here? Yeah, I got a few. Okay, would you put a picture of your daughter? Or if you have a son, it's a son. Would you put that up on a billboard in the middle of Boston, like for everybody to see? What's that? If she was a model? Well, then she can have her own agency and make that choice, which is great. But I don't, I don't think most people would just be like, oh yeah, here's a, here, let me plaster this, this very nice private moment that she had during her birthday or something like that for the entire world to see. But people do it every day. They have no problem. And posting it on Instagram, posting it on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, and believe me, none of those companies are any better than the other. The problem isn't like, though we need to find like this really nice social media. No, 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 no. Social media is inherently a problem, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. If I was, well, I don't think they'd let me talk about that. Um, but anyway, you wouldn't do that, but you do that all the time. And it's no different than putting up and plastering some private moment or whatever on a gigantic billboard and pick your city around the world and there it is, bammo. But if you realize, if you think about it that way, you're like, oh, wait a second, I'm just like giving this to the whole world, what the hell? I think that that, is a great start to reconsidering your relationship with these tech giants, which again, don't care about you. So what do we do? How many people here use Signal on their uh, smartphones? Oh, all right, well, talk's over. <laughs> Thanks everybody, that was great, no. 
that's a good start. Signal's great, getting people on board with Signal. Um, if anybody has problems with Signal, feel free to jump on the Q&A for that. Okay, uh, Signal is fantastic. Obviously, you all know that. You know, you can do video calls, all these different things, and Signal's just gonna get better. They started the Signal Foundation earlier this year, back in April, um, and it was, I, I expect great things from this Signal Foundation. Ironically, the Signal Foundation came into existence because one of the co-founders of WhatsApp, how many people here use WhatsApp? Yeah, okay, all right, no, that's good. I'm glad, only two, all right. Um, the, the guy that co-founded WhatsApp, which WhatsApp got bought out by Facebook a few years ago, he was still working at Facebook because generally when Facebook buys a company, and I, I kind of respect them for this, they leave the management team alone, they leave like the developers alone, and they just do their own thing. That's starting to change, but for years it's been that way. Like Instagram's always been a small team even though Facebook owns it. Um, he decided to leave Facebook for some reason this year, and then he goes and gives 50 million of his own dollars to Signal. The guy leaves Facebook and gives 50 million dollars. I mean, he's, he's got the cushiest job on the planet. He could just sit there because they just want his name there so that people still have faith in using WhatsApp, right? But he leaves and says, no, I'll take 50 million dollars and I'll put it on this. Do you think there's a problem at Facebook? Yeah, I think there's a problem at Facebook. I think somebody voted with their feet, which is a great thing to do. So, uh, yeah, Signal, I expect great things to, uh, to come out of that. Another app I want to tell you about, and I was teaching this um, at my workshop earlier today, or I was showing this at my workshop earlier today. The, it's called Briar, B-R-I-A-R. -R. Okay, this is the Briar Project. And this is a very exciting app that I'm just, I'm trying to get everybody on board with. Uh, you all know what Tor is, you said that, so great. Uh, it is only available on Android. We have iOS, I know I have some iOS users out here. There, there's no way that there isn't. Okay. Um, so it's only available on Android. So maybe, I don't know if you want, that makes you want to do the switch or what, but that's another, you know, that's another conversation. Uh, but the Briar app is a social platform, not really social media, because it has messaging, private messaging. It has groups, the group feature, which is really the main reason most people stay on Facebook other than they want to fuck their neighbor. We just, we gotta live with that one, okay? Um, then it also has blogging. You can do blogging within it. It has um, a forum feature, like good old fashioned BBS style forums. I used to love those. Oh man, the people you'd meet on that. I mean, you never wanna meet them in real life, but they're pretty awesome online, I gotta say. So anyway, um, this, yeah, the Briar app allows for a lot of this different stuff. Now here's the, re here's the real, real center for the Briar app is that it can work without the internet. What? It works without the internet? How the hell is that possible? Well, let's talk about it. So like I said, this is jam packed with so many different technologies that you don't even know are there. I, don't e I can't even list all of them off, so don't worry. Um, but a couple of them that they have, one is Bluetooth, everybody knows about Bluetooth, you connect your headphones with those. Uh, then there's also, uh, there's also what's your Wi-Fi radio, right? Now your Wi-Fi radio can actually work where, not where it's connecting to some ISP somewhere into some router, but where it can actually connect between devices. Right now, if we all installed the Briar app, we could all be communicating with each other, with each other from, uh, maybe we'd get, it won't bounce off of devices, but we might get, I don't know, 50 feet, something like that, depends upon the clearing and everything. But you could have an entire communication, an entire, for lack of a better phrase, because I hate social media, but an entire social media network right here, right now, with the Briar app. Um, it can work over the internet, so we could also talk to people on long distance, but it's pretty impressive that it works completely, like if, if the, you know, everybody talks about the, the government internet kill switch, right? How many people believe that that's a thing? The government kill switch for the internet. Yeah, it's real, yeah. I, I, I personally, I, there, well, there's, anyway, there's a law that says that they can do it. I don't know that they necessarily have so much the technology to do it. But anyway, um, if they did that, the Briar app still works. There's other technologies that you might have to worry about, but it, that proves my point, okay, is that that, that that will work. So it's something I want you to consider looking into. It has one, or well, it has two flaws. One is, is that it drains your battery, so you don't want to leave it open all the time. Uh, and it runs, because and it drains your battery because it's encrypting everything through Tor, which is great. Uh, but the other flaw is that to be able to add somebody to your, you know, to your uh, network or to your, to your app so you can chat with them or whatever, to do that, 
the person has to be right in front of you. Or you have to do it over Skype. And because you're going to do what's called a handshake, an encrypted handshake between two QR codes, where you're going to scan each other's QR codes and then you're in the app for all time. Um, that's a problem for some people, right? Because how many people use Signal to communicate with people a thousand miles away? Everybody, you know, sure. So you'd either have to get together at some point to make this happen, or again, you could do it over, I mean, you wouldn't have to use Skype, you could use like riot.im, you could use something that's a little more encrypted, that's a little more open source perhaps, so you don't feel so bad about it. So you could do like this QR code scan over, you know, remotely over video, but that's, that's one of the major challenges with that. So, but I do recommend looking into uh, using the Briar app as well. Um, if, does anybody have any questions at this point? Because I'm getting into about the 20 minute mark. If you wanna start lining up on up here, we can get into that. Um, I mean, the app recommendations that I can make to you, and if you have, if there's something that you do and you're like, hey, I wanna be able to do this privacy-minded and encrypted and all that, I'm happy to answer that question, okay? My main goal today is to get you to reevaluate your relationship with the infinity box because we all have a problem, okay? And I'm not saying I'm immune to it either. Uh, okay, All right. yeah, let's, why don't we just go right to the questions. Go for it, please. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, Thank you. So, I bought these, these things, whatever you okay. call them, as satchels that say they block all signals. Yeah, so right, fair to engage. does it, stuff like that. So, is that really true, and is it worth using it? I think they're, so, okay, here's, you raise, you raise an interesting point, okay? And, that is, and this is a point I should have mentioned earlier. Um, I'm gonna say yes. To answer your question quickly, yes, it's worth it. If you are a target, and please get this, get this in, if you are a target of an alphabet soup organization, there is nothing you can do. Like, they're going to get your data. It's just going to happen. Too much of this stuff, and I could get into a whole bunch of technicals, too much of this stuff, I mean, they're just, like Signal, Signal's so great, and it really is. But what's an easy way to defeat Signal? I'll, there's two possibilities, I'm gonna give you two. One is a camera, someone taking a picture of what you typed out. Two, that keyboard is not owned and operated or developed by Signal, that keyboard that you're using. How many people use Swift Key? Come on, yeah, we got a couple. All right, that's Microsoft. You're typing that into Signal. Do you think Microsoft's collecting that data? Probably. I use SwiftKey too, so don't feel bad. Um, so yeah, so you have those issues. My point in saying all this is that really all we can do is mitigate. You know, like every little, and I think every little step is worth it. Using Signal is worth it. Hell, even using WhatsApp is worth it. Like a lot of these other things are worth it. A real Faraday cage, you, you're, you're like, anybody ever see the movie Enemy of the State with Gene Hackman and Will Smith? Yeah, 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 great movie. If you haven't, go watch it. It's from like 99, but it's phenomenal. Um, he's like, he has this entire chain link, chain link fence around him. It's like the NWO is about to come out, you know, and there's gonna be this wrestling match. It's phenomenal. Uh, but I mean, that's like the level you have to go to really block everything. But I think those are still very useful and there are things they will block. And again, if we're just mitigating, you know, if we're just thinking, okay, we're just gonna make it as expensive as we possibly can for them, for them, you know, they, them, those, to collect metadata about me, it's worth it. Also, an aluminum, aluminum foil or like a Mylar bag can very much do a similar thing. So does that- So microwaves, if you put this in the microwave? Yeah, there's, there's some truth to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing with microwaves that are great, put your clothes in them. Just talking about RFID, things like that, just saying. Who knows what's in those uh, little plastic buttons? All right, go for it. Great question. So I have a privacy case, security cage. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, these things actually do work really well. Sure. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I, I think a lot of those are great. Like I, I really have, I, a lot of those work for varying signals. It's, it's a very large explanation as to where they're, they're you know, might not exactly work, but that, those are totally valid. In regards to Signal, you said uh, that like using Swipe is like a manufactured version of a keyboard. So if you use the, the microphone option that they have nowadays, where you can mm -hmm. talk and send a voice message, is that the same thing? Somebody's collecting that data. Is there a way to be? Yeah. 
so, so here's a funny story. So, I mean, what you could do, if you wanted to be careful, there's a keyboard called the hacker keyboard. Unfortunately, it hasn't been updated in like two or three years, okay? But you could use that and maybe feel a little bit better about it because it's not even Google's stock keyboard that's built into Android. Um, but yeah, using like, like the voice stuff, so the, the point I wanna bring up with that that's interesting is you have companies like Apple, right? Where they would say, well, we don't hold your voice data because the, all these companies collect this voice data for varying reasons to make you know, Google Assistant better or to make Alexa better, things like this. Um, Apple claims that you know, they won't keep your data past six months. There's a reason, how many people here love Siri? Like Siri, does not Siri work great for you? No hands, it's because Siri doesn't work great. Reason being is because actually Apple doesn't keep that data for six, or they, they don't hold it, like they, they're honest. They don't hold the data past the six months. But I think that's eventually going to change where as voice assistants take over more, that voice data is gonna become more and more precious. Apple will probably change their mind or they'll just lie to people and say that they're not doing it um, when they actually are because it's, they are eons behind even Microsoft when it comes to voice assistants and things like that. So that's very precious data that I'm, I'm I can't say like 100% that it's always being collected, but I think it, it fits the bill uh, that it is. So uh, next question. Okay, so obviously I missed your Dark Android workshop, maybe you discussed this. Oh, it was like $200 a ticket, and I am not worth that, baby, don't worry. Right, so <laughs> I am currently looking for a new um, ROM for my Android device. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was using the CyanogenCon, um, or not CyanogenCon, Copperhead OS. Okay. Which is kind of a uh, privacy hardened Android kernel, but that project kind of imploded, so I'm looking for something, a good balance uh, between privacy and security, Okay, so, um, so you said lineage, you don't feel fits your bill? Right, uh, it doesn't have the, uh, the hardening, like you can't uh, verify the bootloader. Uh, oh, right, 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 okay. So it fits the privacy bill, but not necessarily security, and I, I'm waiting on a uh, product by uh, Purism called the Libra Smartphone. Yes, which they did a crowdfund for, and yeah. Right. So, but until then, I'm looking for new alternatives to Copperhead OS that has regular security updates and also privacy, no Google Play kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, don't don't go with Black Phone for one. Um, but Copperhead OS, they are now selling their own phones, and they're they're they sell you a Pixel One or a Pixel Two, and they're about a thousand dollars. But that's about the best you can get out of the gate. Lineage OS, I would say, is right now. I get your point on that. Like the best one out there is Replicant, right? But then you can't use Wi-Fi. Like, well, like, and, and you have, what, five devices that it works on? I mean, it really limits you. Um, I'd, I would honestly say right now, Lineage OS is a thing, but I understand that maybe, you know, at some point we could get maybe Copperhead OS being a little more broad, but they've really turned that into a, a moneymaker. And I'm not saying they shouldn't make money, but what, what do you got? Well, the Copperhead OS project, you know, I was totally on board with that. Yeah. When did this happen? This was uh, maybe a week and a half ago. A week and a half ago? See folks, I can miss things. Okay, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. Yeah, you know, here's another thing. You wanna know when you got a really smart guy up here? He'll tell you, I'll get back to you on that. Or he'll say, I don't know. That, that's brilliant. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, round of applause for that bit of, for that genius, right? All right, uh, because we get too many people, I think, that come up here that are like, oh yeah. I have the answer for everything. But anyway, okay. What do you got? So, you talk mostly about software privacy. Sure. There was the Librem phone that was mentioned. Copperhead OS, I don't know how I didn't hear about that, but I'm, I'm not doubting it. Uh, Copperhead OS was a great option because they were selling you like the Pixel phones that were all, they, they were doing it right. Uh, John McAfee, sure as fuck don't buy his stuff. Um, I mean, not for a second. Don't buy anything of his. Uh, but um, yeah, like that phone, I wouldn't recommend. The best thing right now, my best option is, like especially if you're on a budget, who isn't? Um, 
Le Echo, there's this funny company called Le Echo that tried to, is a Chinese company that tried to invade America in an economic way. And they, they failed, like they failed hard, like the next day. It, it's just, I can't wait for the movie to come out about this. Uh, but they sold a bunch of smartphones that were very powerful, very, very nice. Uh, and, but the, again, the company tanked. And so they're like getting rid of these things at like $100, $150 a pop. Thing is, I wouldn't recommend buying those because the company's gone under and they're not gonna push security updates, so that's no good. But the aforementioned Lineage OS, you can put Lineage OS onto that and then you get all kinds of great updates. So I think the best thing right now is, is really going, you know, the best thing we can do right now is going with a custom ROM uh, you know, on, on, on hardware that's pretty well supported. And right now, actually, the, the Echo Pro 3 is the, I think, most uh, most popular Lineage OS phone out there. So that, that's the route that I would go, if, if that answers. Yeah. You mentioned about hardware that listens to your listeners for keywords. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. How many people are doing that? Which phones are safer? You have to buy old. Yeah, you'd have to buy old phones. Like, and I mean phones on the order of five years ago. Um, phones that probably wouldn't work very well, or like would be pretty slow today. But again, that slowness, right? Security and convenience. Because pretty much all of them have the voice coprocessor built into it. It comes with the ARM standard. What's that? Um, I mean, you could have a little more control of it with a certain ROM if they did it right. I mean, another problem that we have in the world today is soft switches. Soft switches means it's like a, you know, the little switch that you flip on your touch screen that says, oh yeah, I turned off location services. Right. We all know that didn't actually happen with Google and we do know that, it's proven. Um, you know, as to where we don't have hardware switches anymore. One thing I like that McAfee was kind of proposing, John McAfee was proposing with his little security phone, was that it had switches on the back that, um, that would supposedly physically cut off the radios, like the Bluetooth radios, it would kill the mic and things like this. That's really what we need. Um, the problem is he has a problem with software, so it's not really solving anything. Um, but I love the idea of having switches on the phone where you cut off that mic, that mic's done. Uh, could you buy one of those and then replace it with better software? Maybe, if he ever really puts it out there. It's a, it's a possibility, but you know, I don't have a whole lot of faith in a whole lot of much. So, what do we got? Sure. That's theoretically sent as plain text, even if you encrypt it. Correct. So what, it's just, you know, this email, because that's sometimes kind of, that's the best way to get the, uh, well, the big message across. Yep. So like, what's your solution, like a particular ISP, or just, you know, put PGP and, and hope that works, and you know, getting the mail, keeping the mail, getting it off the internet. I know some of it's like impossible to kind of control over the middle of Right. Yeah. Um, so if I were to now, a popular option out there is Proton Mail, but there are and that's at protonmail.ch that people go with. Um, Proton Mail has an interesting track record. They are open source now. Um, there was the recent PGP fail. Did anybody hear about that? This is the one I'm up on. Okay. So, yeah, you heard it because you listened to my show. Uh, PGP fail was where they found an exploit in PGP that had to do with, like, exploiting HTML or something with the email. Um, ProtonMail didn't fall prey to that, so a lot of people are thinking, well, this is a really great option to go with. Um, that's one possibility that you could do where that allows for automatic, because ProtonMail allows for automatic PG, PGP encryption for encryption of the emails. There's some limitations that come along with how many emails you can send and all that, but that's an option. Um, the best real mail company out there right now is probably FastMail. There's no mail company that's, like what I used to recommend was um, GMX, which GMX is a European company. And the reason that I recommended that was because, and this is why we have to do these kind of talks every year, folks. Uh, because Copperhead OS is fucked. Well, no, I don't, I don't know that yet, but right, I believe you. Anyway, um, with, with GMX, all their servers were in Europe. And so kind of like how Microsoft has taken on the DOJ, I felt a little more comfortable about that. Um, but two things have happened. One is they opened up a server farm in Kansas. So now they fall under legislation that already existed. And also we now know, thanks to the Cloud Act, 
no, your emails are not safe if they're overseas. Uh, so GMX, I don't necessarily recommend. So you might as well go with an American company, or you know, a, a United States company, or somebody that that does it right. Fastmail is great for that, but then you're just going to use PGP. And for PGP, uh, I, actually on your mobile device, the best PGP encryption you can do is uh, called Open Keychain, and rock with that. I mean, email has so many problems, like the aforementioned HTML. I mean, I, most people don't realize just how much information can be gleaned from your email. Uh, even, even when you're doing, using PGP, you've got to use a lot of technologies to really make that a lot more private. But you're so right in that email is a pretty unique animal in the amount of information that it can transmit and the way that it allows you to communicate. Because like sending long stuff through Telegram, which don't do that, uh, or I mean don't use Telegram, um, you know, and all these things, it's, it's inconvenient and it doesn't, it doesn't look right. Like it doesn't organize itself well. So yeah, PGP encryption, I still, even with PGP fail, which people can read up on that, I still think PGP encryption is totally fine. You can set it up with an app like Open Keychain, or you can use Mailvelope, which is available for Firefox or Chrome, don't use Chrome, and, and, and that, that would be the way to go. That's really the best recommendation I can give as far as email goes. So I hope that answers it. Fastmail.fm, that's, you gotta pay for it, but they also don't, or at least as far as we know, they don't collect all of your data. You, know, you don't have to pay for Gmail because they're harvesting everything that's in your emails, way to go. Okay, any other questions? I think I'm getting to just about to the point where I need to stop. Anything else? You can ask me anything. Hell, it doesn't even have to be tech related. Oh, we got somebody coming up, all right. He's heard it didn't have to be tech related, now he's gonna say what's under the hat. I'm not gonna tell him. Yeah. What is a reasonable amount of security where you're not being paranoid or careless? There's no such thing as being too paranoid. You know, I mean, like, there, there's just go all the way. I mean, go go nuts. You know, like, there. Well, there's the old saying: you're only paranoid. from a country you've never been. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say. I mean, there's you know the old saying: you're only paranoid if you're wrong. And well. A lot of the things that we're finding out that Snowden talked about and others, oh, guess what? You know, cypherpunks have been right for 20 years. It, but they already knew, you know, like they, they, they knew that it was happening. Uh, Aren't you probably wrong about getting rid of them? About getting rid of? Like being spied on. Like it's all probabilities, but if there's no amount of paranoia that is enough, then aren't you probably wrong about thinking you've gotten rid of them looking at you? Oh yeah, well that's the thing. Okay, so that's my point, or kind of the point I hinted at earlier was, you can only really make it expensive for them. But here's the second point. I think I got lost in my own mind, which happens by the second, um, sorry, that I was gonna bring up earlier, which is a lot of these alphabet super organizations, you know, take your pick of the, of the name, they're relying as much as you using these services, they're relying upon you having this to do their work now, and we know it. And there's plenty of cases where they have missed entire situations simply because people weren't carrying around a cell phone anymore. So there's, there is provable uh, uh, benefits to, or like just encrypting things. There's provable benefits to this because they, I mean, these guys are literally at these companies, most of them are just sitting around perusing Facebook. Of course, they're looking at your stuff because Facebook doesn't care if they do that. Okay, they're looking at your stuff, um, but they're becoming lazy. I think. I think it's fair to say they're becoming complacent and lazy and relying upon that. So if you get away from that, you fall into the cracks. It's not saying that you're 100% safe. I'd never claim that. But I think you start to fall through the cracks when you get away from what they have become reliant upon. So I... One more first one. Please. Uh, if my Firefox won't download an MP3, what can I use besides Google? To download an MP3? Yeah. I'm not, Podcasts. For some reason, uh, Okay, um, so here's a great recommendation. Do you use Android? Do you use Android? Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a, a... Some amount of Google is completely inescapable. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, so, well, there's a way around that, but we're out of time. But anyway, Fdroid, fdroid.org. Uh, please check this out. It is an alternative app store. It has a great app called AntennaPod that could actually help you out with that. It's totally open source. Thank you for the questions. We got time for one more, or do I have to wrap it up? All right, we got a quick one. Very quickly talk about Mobile and desktop. Do not use Chrome. 
I mean, just just don't. Uh, go, Firefox has become is a. If you thought Firefox has gotten bloated and old, they just came out with a new version in November, version 57 that has a whole new engine. It is lightning fast. Yes, there are some pages that load a little funny on it, but while it may not be as secure as Chrome or it may not be as convenient, it does genuinely respect your privacy. Go with Firefox, and Firefox is also on Android, and they've even made stuff on iOS, and it's great. And that's it. Thank you.